So yeah, I wanted to brag about my video game collection. Yeah. If you're all down for that. Uh, when I was just a wee lad, I collected a lot of these. But they always sucked. There were a lot of very expensive, cool comics that I would never get my hands on because even if I did, my friends would mercilessly trade them away from me for just stupid trades because I was an idiot. And I guess not really an idiot because, you know, not understanding the intrinsic value of various comic books is not exactly a sign of intelligence. But uh, most of my comics sucked, like this one. But uh, I used to think about going back in time to the 60s, right? You know, I was like, oh, if I could go back in time, I could buy up all those X-Men comics, and I'd have them. I'd be so wealthy. Wow, I'd have like $3,000 for a first issue of... Yeah, it's not real money, actually. But when I was a kid, I didn't realize that. So. When I was growing up, I soon realized that, uh, well, a little bit too late, but that I was going through the new comic book revolution, which was the video game revolution. I grew up with an S. My God, wouldn't I kill to have all those games back in the original packaging? Uh, I certainly would right now, but uh, not so much since I've discovered that there are a few rules to uh, acquiring such material while you're going through sort of the dead zone between it being valuable and it being not being valuable. Of course, video game stuff is valuable right now, but I think it's in that sort of area, like in the 70s, where everybody's just throwing the boxes of comic books out. Like, what do we need these stupid things for? So uh, the rules are, first, just ask. When I worked at this company, uh, Mac Home Journal, they had a pimpin' in the back room, in the original box. And I said, can I have that? And they said, sure, get it out of here. And the other rule is flea markets, garage sales, and thrift stores are the absolute center of your universe. You can never pass one up if you're going to be a video game collector. Uh, so the highlights of my collection, the Apple Pippin. If you've never heard of this, Apple and Bandai in 1995, 94, got together and decided, let's make a video game console. This interactive CD entertainment thing is for us. And so Bandai went out and made this console. You'll notice what looks like a laptop on top. No, that's actually a drawing tablet. That doesn't work. At least it doesn't work in mine. Mine is a black American version. The white one was actually distributed in Japan. The American version really never made it to market, so I've got a beta pippin. It came with a modem and an encyclopedia on a CD, because you never, ever want to update such a thing. <laughs> uh, needless to say, it was a total failure, and my Pippin does nothing but crash. Uh, that's all it really does, is crash and play Lowly Worm. Richard Scary stuff, there's like a little party count. Uh, another one of my highlights of my collection is my top-loading Nintendo, only because it works. So, top, if you are into video game collecting and you like an S, you have to get a top-loader. You never have to blow on cartridges, you never have to go ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching, Come on, please, no! Uh, I actually brought with me some of my stuff. I can't show it to you in the dark, and Mike didn't bring his flashlights. No, hey, whoa, hey! Okay, so when I got my top loader, actually a piece of equipment that was distributed with this console cart, uh, this cart, and this little doohickey you plug into the front of your console, and then this plugs into a bicycle, or rather a, a, a detector for the wheels of your bicycle. You put your bicycle on the stand, and you ride your bike in the bike race. But it was really a computerized training thing for bike racers. And it came with an S. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It's a completely, ridiculously not interesting find. And televisions are everywhere. You can find the games, you can find them with uh, the, the overlays and everything. Who cares, right? Well, I found this one at the flea market. Laney College Flea Market in a box. It came with all this stuff and a bag of meth. <laughs> I am not kidding, that was the best. Somewhere in Oakland there was a, a tweaker going, God damn it, where the fuck you <laughs> I had no idea, I flushed it, of course. I mean, I'm not gonna sniff straight to powders. But, I mean, come on, flea market, Oakland? Yeah, I know what it was. Uh, anyway, the grand finale, the Lady College flea market gave me this. This is the greatest find of my entire career. You'll notice on the, the right side all these little tiny EPROMs if you know what EEPROMs are, the little chips. On the right side, of course, that same day for $5 a piece, I bought those two uh, early Nintendo bookends. These EEPROMs I bought in two pieces. I saw the first when I was walking by, one of them said Cabbage Patch Atari. I immediately whipped out my video game collector's guide, and, uh, oh, I'm gonna go over. Anyway, looked it up, there was no such game. So, I bought the whole thing, all these ROMs for $27, took them home, and this is what was actually on those ROMs. An unreleased Atari 2600 game, Cabbage Patch Games Adventures in the Park. Whoa. Sword and the Sorcerer for League of Vision. A rumored game, it was only a demo actually, it's not playable. Dragon's Lair, 
never released for ColecoVision, only released for the Atom computer. Uh, video Hustler, a pool game, uh, debug chips on a lot of games that were molested with debuggers. They were in line. And let me show you some screenshots. So this is Sword of the Sorcerer. It's just an unplayable demo. There was an ad in a magazine years ago, so people have been lusting over this one, but you can't play it. It sucks. This is Cabbage Patch Atari, actually a fairly cool platformer. You would be surprised. As far as Atari games go, this is not bad. It was originally released for the ColecoVision. It was actually originally before that released in Japan as an MSX game that was ported to the ColecoVision and brought to America, and then it was put to the Atari. It's just you run from side to side, and you jump over shit. It's Pitfall, but you're a Cabbage Patch kid. <laughs> it's also probably the only Atari 2600 game with a splash screen. When you actually start up the game, it says Atari 2600 Cabbage Patch Kids. You have to press this is Dragon's Lair uh, for ColecoVision. You have to play it with the virtual ColecoVision on Windows. Nothing else works. It's fucking impossible, but you can get past the first screen to the second, and then that's it, and it loops. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to play with these ROMs, they're on uh, jism.net, roms.zip, and uh, not an asshole, I released the whole fucking thing, no holding it hostage and trying to sell it, which a lot of people do in this industry. So. Industry, video game collectors. <laughs> what am I thinking? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for going long. Oh my god, my beard. Jesus Christ. Thank you. You're not sorry at all. <laughs> I'm not sorry. Alex brought a poster over here. Oh yeah, there's a, I put up a, a new poster out there if anybody wanted to see it. Oh, that's, oh, that's what she needs to write. It's a bunch of Atari 2600 games. It's an original Atari 20. I have a, a catalog if anybody wants to look through it. The greatest thing about the Atari 2600 era is the box art. You think that heavy metal music albums were awesome in the 80s? Box art for 2600 games. The, uh, the Space Invaders game is a city that's f taking off. Just like the Boston album cover. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you kind of have, have something for your imagination. <laughs>